and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to ending corporate domination and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Julia DeGraw, candidate for Portland City Council. Please note that because a candidate is on our program, that does not mean that the Alliance for Democracy supports or endorses that candidate. So welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, you've been on before. It's true, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, and you were, uh, when you've been on before, you were on, uh, do your role as the organizer with Food and Water Watch here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I think it was for a few issues, but the main one was probably the fight to uh, keep a Nestle water bottling facility out of the Columbia River Gorge, uh, yes. which is a fight we ultimately won, which is very satisfying. Yes, yes, <laughs> ultimately won it. It's very nice to be able to say that. Mm -hmm. so, yes, so uh, Nestle closed up their office in Cascade Locks a, a week or two ago and are no longer here in, in Northern Oregon. I don't know if they're in anywhere in Oregon. They're nowhere in the Northwest, and that was oh. our goal, was to keep them out of the Northwest and uh, in two other communities in Washington on the uh, on the Washington side of the gorge also kicked out Nestle. So I think we can safely say that the gorge is protected from Nestle. Right, yes, yes. Well, anyway, congratulations on, on helping all of us achieve this, uh, this victory. Definitely, right. it was yeah. my pleasure and it was Really exciting to get the final closure on that from from uh, decisive action finally from from Governor Brown after yes. nine years of nine fighting years. that fight. Right. So yeah. anyway, yeah, right. very yeah. good closure on that. Uh, <laughs> great, great, yeah. But now you're on to uh, a, a, a new endeavor, mm -hmm. running for the Portland City Council. Mm -hmm. uh, what position are you are you running for? I'm running for position two, which is currently held uh, by incumbent uh, Commissioner Nick Fish. Nick Fish, okay, and. Uh, all all city commissioner races in in Portland or citywide. Exactly. They're not by district. Exactly. Right. So right. if you uh, want to run for Portland City Council, you have to run a citywide election, um, and uh, and there are no term limits either. So it's mm -hmm. it's often very challenging to unseat an incumbent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a as a, as a candidate, do you have some thoughts about how we might change that? Yes. So one of the main reasons why I'm running for Portland City Council is uh, is that the at-large commissions, the at-large election system that we have, um, uh, as well as uh, the commission system that we have, in which the mayor assigns bureaus to the five commissioners uh, uh, that run the city. Um, both the, that that structure of government was actually born out of the Jim Crow era. Um, the whole point of at-large elections mm -hmm. was designed to consolidate power into the hands of generally wealthy white men. And it's why historically we've had representation in this city um, from exactly that, wealthy white men who often live on the west side of town. Um, and I think that really shows in, um, in the quality of services, in the quality of the roads, um, and uh, in, in southeast Portland. You know, that lack of representation has really been hurting um, where, frankly, a majority of the people in the city now live, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the way Portland is laid out, 82nd Avenue is kind of the center of the city at this point, mm -hmm. and it gets treated like it's far out east side, and that's just not an accurate way to treat East Portland uh, ever, but certainly not now. Mm -hmm. So uh, my one of my major platform issues is to democratize City Hall, um, and I think we can do that by shifting toward districts where there would be people elected within their neighborhoods to represent their constituents rather than having a lot of commissioners uh, you know on council who are representing their bureaus you'd have actual representatives that are working for the people mm -hmm. okay and, and you live in southeast Portland yes right? uh, if I were elected uh, tomorrow you know what I mean if I were to get on city council right now I would be the only uh, city commissioner living east of Cesar Chavez Boulevard let alone east of 82nd uh -huh. Okay. Is, is that ever or, or Not or ever. Currently? There have um, uh, there have been some folks who've lived in East Portland. I believe Le Randy Leonard was one of the, f oh, uh, yeah. the okay. people who lived in East Portland. But uh, again, if you were to look at the st statistical average, um, uh, a majority of uh, Portland commissioners have been um, from the, the east side. Mm -hmm. What difference do you think? I mean, from the west side, excuse <laughs> from me. From the west side, <laughs> right, yeah. What, what difference do you think it really makes? whether uh, commissioners are, are from the west side versus the east side? No, that's a really good question. Um, uh, Portland is one of um, 
in terms of the commission system, we're only one of two major cities in America that still operate under a commission system, which I think is indicative of the fact that it's not an effective form of government. Um, and in terms of at-large positions, uh, we have a really good example recently in Anaheim, of all places. Uh, mm -hmm. They used to have a five-person uh, at-large position, uh, at-large uh, city government similar to Portland's. Um, and in 2016, and, and they, uh, they shifted to a districted form of government, and they went from having a bunch of white people running their city, primarily men, to having almost a majority people of color. Um, and granted, that's different in Anaheim than it is in Portland in terms of uh, the number of, of people of color, but the bottom line is there was almost an immediate transition to diversifying the city council uh, just by changing the structure of how uh, people were represented. Um, and I actually do think it makes a really big difference. Uh, right now, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double whammy working against democracy and working against people in that we have these at-large positions with no term limits. So once you're elected, you're pretty much untouchable in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I'm going to prove that that's not true. <laughs> but, uh, but generally, you know, if you don't have a lot of money or a huge amount of name recognition, it's really hard to take on an incumbent, and it's designed that way. Um, and without term limits. Uh, but in addition to that, you have a bunch of commissioners that are uh, more beholden to their bureaus than they are to the people that got them into office. And if you have a problem in your neighborhood that doesn't fall t in it, you know, underneath a uh, bureau's d jurisdiction, good luck getting anyone in City Hall to really care about that issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you might get better response from the county than you would from the city at that point. And so I, I would argue that some of the biggest problems that we're facing, like uh, uh, rent stabilization, um, where we need to go down to Salem and lobby to change state law so that we're allowed to do rent stabilization. We, there are so many things we need to, uh, there's so many laws that we need to change at the state level in order for the city to be proactive in solving our problems. And I believe that the focus on these bureaus is what stops the city from being, uh, working harder in Salem to actually get what we need here in Portland. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And, and, and so I, I would assume that another reason for uh, going to districts would be that you would get more people of color mm -hmm. uh, and more women. We need more people of color and more women and people who have a lived experience in the neighborhoods where they're serving, right? Um, and, and who will be responsive uh, to community groups when they come uh, to them with their problems. And I think another thing that needs to, another thing that absolutely needs to shift in city council is the way they do community input is generally by the time they get about 90% of the way there on what they perceive to be a solution or a project, um, then they take community input. Mm -hmm. And it's too late to really, you know, seriously take the input from the community yes. at that point. You mm -hmm. can't, you know, change a whole lot once you're 90% there and you spent all the money, right? And you've talked to all the consultants, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, under uh, a more representative system, there's a huge opportunity to, to do community involvement from the beginning of uh, programs, from the beginning of, of, of pro solving these problems. So by the time you've uh, gotten to the point that you're pretty much done with coming up with your 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 project or your or the the piece of uh, you know uh, legislation you're trying to pass, uh, the community will have been brought on board from the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how you end up with solutions that will actually work in our communities and that have actual buy-in. And so that's there's a much higher uh, there's a much uh, it's much easier for communities to have direct involvement and leadership and decision-making processes when you have a representative districted system. Mm -hmm. um, and here in Portland, uh, there's a really interesting Sightline Institute um, study uh, that shows that um, because Portland is such a white city, frankly, um, and we don't have any specific neighborhoods where there's a large enough density of people of color to guarantee that we get more, equi more equity in City Hall just by having one member districts, um, there's, uh, there's a really interesting idea out there about having multiple member districts, which you're, where you're much more likely to get uh, diversity of candidates who are both representing the geographic diversity of the city and, um, and, and, and racial diversity as well. Hmm. So I think that's uh, uh, what I'm really excited about doing, what this campaign is about, is about building a coalition, a broad-based coalition across the city to come up with our goals for what districting should look like uh, and then working together to come up with a Portland-specific districting system that actually will get at our goals, right? That will get us to equity, that will get us to representation, um, and, that's, and, and that is a huge step in the right direction of shifting the power from where I would say right now is in the hands of developers and corporate interests mm -hmm. into the hands of people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And speaking of 
developers and other corporate interests, you have some thoughts about money and politics. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I just, uh, I actually just signed the move to amend uh, um, a candidate's uh, pledge, which uh, means that I fully support um, getting corporate money out of politics. Mm -hmm. Corporations are not people. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah, pretty pretty right. simple. Right, yeah. Cor corporations <laughs> are not, yeah, and yeah, we we like to say that here. Corporations <laughs> are not people. Yeah. And money is not speech. Exactly. Right, yeah. And, exactly. And, uh, and that's actually why I'm not taking any corporate donations on this campaign. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll work really closely with unions. I'm 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 very pro worker. Uh, I think uh, as far as um, we talk about uh, the housing crisis. Um, and a lot of our problems is they, they exist in a bubble, but at the end of the day, it's an affordability issue. We have a majority of people who work in this city who are underemployed. You know, and if we raise the bar for workers, if you know people got paid a living wage in this city for the work that they do, um, that would go very far in helping to solve our problems. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, the only candidate running for city council who's being really serious about developing policies that will uh, raise the bar for workers. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, we can't solve our problems in isolation from each other and ignoring the plight of underemployed people in the city is is a huge mistake in my mm -hmm. mind. Uh, yeah, it is. And, and you know, in my mind, the, the other thing that's coming down the, down the pike is this whole artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and what it's going to do to people who have uh, less than uh, le uh, jobs that are not necessarily you know, high skilled or technology skilled mm -hmm. uh, jobs, and how are those people going to live? Right, well, right. We need to be really creative about. Um, uh, I'm really excited about apprenticeship programs, but not just for. Um, I mean, we need it for building trades. We need it for every trade. Um, but the future of, of even trade work is going to be robotics. Right. You know, mm -hmm. having people who know how to work with. Um, computers and machines, right? And, and, and I think uh, we need to be really forward thinking about developing um, uh, programs that support um, training workers for the economy of the future. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when it comes to energy, right? We could have the amount of jobs we could create building a green local economy is huge. You know, and I think mm -hmm. it just—it's a matter of political will and of investing in, in, um, in programs that help retrain people for the jobs that we need. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, I mean, we're not going to get those bold solutions from the kind of business as usual, slow change, liberal politics that we see from the current city council. And that's and that's really what it is. You know, why I'm running is about system change. I would argue that the system that we current ha currently have in this city is not and was never designed to serve people and is not designed to be nimble and uh, and progressive in its solutions. And after the most recent election cycle and with climate change uh, and, and with the crisis we have in this city for working people and for housing and, and children going to bed hungry every day, I mean, we our problems are urgent. We can't afford slow change. You know, we, we need a system that's capable of, of building uh, for the future that we all need and deserve. And I would argue that this, you know, the current system isn't set up to deliver what we mm -hmm. need. All right. Okay, great. Uh, so you have a, a beautiful new campaign poster, which I just love. Mm -hmm. And it has in very large letters, tax the rich. It's true. <laughs> and so taxing power is not usually, uh, we don't really think of the cities having that. Uh, if we're going to try and address some of these income inequality and wealth inequality problems, uh, we usually think of those being state or national. Mm -hmm. So why do you have that as your slogan? I think it's really important to state your vision. You need to say what you're about and what you actually mean. Um, and tax the rich is a very bold way of saying that corporations and wealthy individuals need to pay their fair share um, to make our systems actually work for us. Mm -hmm. um, we um, in the state of Oregon have been, as we all know, struggling to pass legislation um, or even a ballot measure to tax corporations despite the fact that Oregon has the lowest tax rate for corporations in the nation. Boggles the mind. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what we've learned, what I've learned from uh, the most recent election cycle is that uh, if we want to create any kind of real change, it needs to come from the local level. We're not going to get 
uh, we're not going to be able to pass, you know, rules to tax the rich at the federal level anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, and the state just dropped the ball. So we need to find really creative ways at the city level that we can uh, uh, do a better job of making sure that the wealthy are paying their fair share. And I think a really good example of, of what we could be doing is instead of bending over backwards to find ways to grant tax breaks to corporations like uh, Amazon, we could do uh, we could do a lot more to, to make uh, Portland more friendly for the small local business owners that are the backbone of this city. And they're getting squeezed out by ex exorbitant rents just like our residents are, right? There's so much that we could do locally to support the right kind of businesses that create jobs, that keep wealth in our communities, um, and that are triple bottom line businesses, right? They care about the environment and their workers um, and are also contributing to the economy. And that's the kind of I realize that tax the rich doesn't say everything I just uh, yeah, said, right. but it is the mm -hmm. beginning of the conversation about yeah. mm -hmm. what does a new economy look like that works for people and not just developers, like affordable housing. Our affordable housing is so expensive because the city can't think outside of the developer box. Mm -hmm. You know, we could do public housing options and community owned housing options and uh, uh, um, uh, land conservation uh, uh, prop like options for, for public housing that would permanently solve our housing crisis by creating below market value housing, but it requires the city not feeling compelled to guarantee profits to developers when mm -hmm. developing these kinds of proposals, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's what I'm trying to talk about when we say tax the rich, it's about really visualizing how do we make the wealthy and the corporate corporations pay their fair share in the system and do a better job of supporting um, the right kinds of businesses. Excellent. And this Great. is yeah. the this is lovely the, image. This <laughs> is the, uh, let's see, there, there we go. It's the, uh, there we go, <laughs> right. So this is, this is the, this is the uh, campaign poster I was just uh, uh, asking you about. So no, everybody gets to see it. All right, great. And actually soon, um, there's a bunch of these and um, I wanna make sure that these are, are made available to folks. So um, there will be uh, the ability to make a donation on our website to, to get a poster. And also uh, we're gonna be putting them up around town in businesses that are supportive. So if you're interested in getting involved in that, um, if you go to the website, you know, you can sign up to, to volunteer. And if you're interested in getting that sign in front of more people's eyes, then like be in touch with the campaign. Excellent, good. So uh, t talk about, um, talk about the environment. <coughs> how, does, how does the, or what kind of policies would you support the city adopting? to uh, get us out of this climate crisis that we're in. Right, well, I, we, need to <coughs> we need to actually implement our um, plan to go 100% renewable by 2050. We have to actually have benchmarks and follow them and be held accountable to them. Um, the city is pretty notorious for putting really great words on paper, but not mm -hmm. necessarily following through on them. That is, uh, that is one issue where we have to get it right. Um, we can't afford to get it wrong. And um, I mean, w like shortly after that, um, that was passed, the city passed a freeway expansion proposal. And I just like every single new uh, um, you know, resolution that the city passes should be seen through the lens of, does this help us or hurt us in achieving our goals of becoming you know, 100% you know, greenhouse gas neutral by 2050? And if it hurts your chances, maybe you need to you know, make some amendments or not follow through with that proposal, right? You know, we really need to be serious about this. And, and, and the, this whole myth of jobs versus the environment is, is exactly that, it is, it is a myth. The, what is going to be necessary to come up with the local solutions to our energy um, problem is gonna create so many jobs. And they're gonna create good jobs, local jobs, jobs that stay, where the money stays in the community. If we have a local based energy that's, co that, that's community owned, I mean, that is going to be huge in mm -hmm. terms of creating jobs in a new market right here in the city. Um, so I think, we need to be really serious about actually implementing the rules that we have and, and being careful that as we implement future policies that they don't hurt our ability to achieve those. Mm -hmm. And I think another really good example of where we can have our cake and eat it too, so to speak, is on cl cleaning up the Superfund. Um, we could have a strong community benefits agreement um, when it comes to creating the jobs that are going to be necessary for cleaning up the, the, the Superfund site along the Willamette, all the Superfund sites along the Willamette. 
Um, and a community benefits agreement is, is just a way of guaranteeing um, prevailing wages, uh, being, giving, being preferential to women and minority contractors, um, and, uh, and just creating really good, high-quality jobs um, for that entire project. So not only are we going to be cleaning up the, the Superfund site, but we're going to be creating quality jobs and building people up um, while we do so. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Oh, and also just one last yeah. one on that mm -hmm. air quality. Uh, the state has been a failure. You know, we don't know yet. Cleaner Air Oregon is still doing its work, but I mean, I'm very skeptical about the state's um, ability to really address our air quality issue, especially since they aren't willing to take on uh, looking at um, all the diesel and and car pollution, which is a huge source of air pollution in the city, especially in southeast Portland. So I think we might need, that I really support efforts to come up with air quality standards that are at the municipal level um, so that we can do a better job of making the air breathable in our city. Mm -hmm. And I, I presume that you also think that the city itself should be lobbying at the, s at the state level for these kinds of laws. Yeah, and exactly. As well. it, just across the board, I think the city needs to be more present in Salem mm -hmm. and partnering with the county to do it too. Uh, the, um, I, I'm, I'm an organizer, I'm all about cooperation, I'm all about building power, I'm all about uh, coalition building, and, and right now, because of the commission system, the city is fairly turfy within itself from bureau to bureau mm -hmm. and competing for limited resources, and, and it's turfy with the county to a degree. They, I mean, they, sometimes they coordinate well and sometimes they don't, um, but my, my feelings are if you are, if we got big problems to solve and the city and the county can just get aiming in the same direction and sharing resources and going to Salem together when it really counts and issues matter to both the county and the city we could really get what we do, we could really get what we need mm -hmm. you know but it requires a, a major shift in how we currently operate okay, right and so going back to this question about the districts and, and reforming the the structure of government would uh, would if if we did that, then would commissioners still have be in charge of bureaus? Or that would, would be. That get I don't think so. I, I mean, not only do I not think so, but like no. <laughs> <is> my answer. <laughs> uh, this is my way of dismantling the commission system. Is we need to replace the commission system with a more representative, democratic system. Um, it's it's uh, that's what makes the most sense. And if you look at what the the, the Multnomah County does, there's representative districts there too. Um, so I think that there's 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 definitely better ways of doing it. Um, but in terms of and they have term limits as well, which I think is really healthy for our at democracy the at the county level. Mm -hmm. They have representative districts in terms of, you know, except for the at large chair, um, and then they have um, two two term limit. You know, and, and I think. Uh, democracy requires it requires new ideas and a little bit of turnover and, and, and new blood and and, it, and 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 it definitely suffers under complacency which is I mean Dan Salzman's a prime example of complacency when you just keep on winning over and over and over again you stop innovating if you ever were innovative but you just get to a point where maybe you know you need we need new ideas mm -hmm. um, so uh, but the uh, the other um, uh, benefit to so yeah, that what what would what you would get um, from a districted system is, uh, you know, there's I, there's multiple ways to do it. But you can have a strong mayor, or you can have a city manager who actually is an executive over the city bureaus, and that city manager is is responsible to the bureau. I mean, excuse me, excuse me, that city manager is responsible to the city council, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then you have someone under the the bureau system, under the, under the commission system we currently have. There's an immense lack of transparency and accountability. It's really, there's almost no executive power in this system. And without an executive power, it means the bureaus don't have a lot of oversight. And that's a huge problem in a city of our size. Mm -hmm. There needs to be accountability and transparency. Mm -hmm. And the commission system does not lend itself to that. And that's a huge problem. Right. So the transparency issue would still, uh, could still exist if we did this kind of restructuring you're talking about? I don't think so. I think that a representative government kind of demands a higher level of transparency and having a, a, a city manager or a strong mayor, either one, but especially a city manager 
um, and a strong auditor. I mean, what I would love to do, like day one when I get into office, is ask the city auditor to do a performance review of every bureau, or at least the suspected problem bureaus, about uh, where resources are being used and if it's being used effectively. And if there's duplication from one bureau to another bureau, and how can we increase the efficiency of how we're using the money we have? People are like, oh, we need to raise taxes. And I'm like, that might be true. We may need more money. I'm sure at the end of the day, we need more money. But I would love to see the city use the money it has more efficiently, right? And the and the current uh, way things are going, there's we don't even know if you know a lot of the programs are are if the money is being spent well or if the or if we're getting the results that we intended. Great. great. So we have uh, about a minute and a half. Yes. <laughs> and one one of, one of the issues you you uh, took very recently uh, had to do with net neutrality. Oh yes. Right. And um, so talk about that and why something that is that is regulated at the federal level, would you talk about as a city issue? Um, we absolutely need to treat the internet as a public utility. Um, at this point in time in, 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 in our lives, in, in, in the modern era, um, in order to seek city services, in order to be a student doing you know, homework and research, in order to be, uh, I mean, to look for work, you need access to the internet. And, um, and the private sector has uh, had plenty of time to get it right. And they haven't, they have failed. You know, Comcast and, and the large companies charge a huge amount of money for poor service. And, um, and that's unacceptable. And uh, we actually have a bunch of municipalities across the United States are, that are providing municipal broadband internet to their people. Um, particularly Chattanooga, Chattanooga Tennessee, um, Comcast didn't want to play with them because they weren't big enough and they were like, fine, we're going to do public internet. And they did the best public internet that, like in the country. Um, so it's clear that it can be done. Um, uh, ultimately, we do need a state and then national policy on treating the internet as a public utility. But again, given how broken things are at the federal si level, we have to build this at the, at the municipal level. Um, and expand from there. And we have to prove that it's possible at the municipal level. And we can uh, tax uh, Comcast or these big co corporations to come up with the money for implementing it. We can do use eminent domain to get the fiber. I mean, I'm not kidding around. There's like ways to do this. We just need political leadership mm -hmm. that's willing to do uh, the so-called difficult thing of actually holding these corporations accountable and moving forward with a policy that actually works for people. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and, and this is this is the whole reason why I wanted to have you on, and we have will have had and will have a couple more candidates on because we really wanted to highlight some of these new uh, innovative ideas that right. so far have not been talked about. So thank thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So we've been talking with Julia DeGraw, a candidate running for Portland City Council and formerly the chief organizer with Food and Water Watch here in the Pacific Northwest. She will be on the ballot, as she just said, uh, on the ballot in uh, May of uh, 2018 right here in Portland, Oregon. So thank you for watching, and I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.